Welcome to Melted. This is Frankie Melted Chapsticks Hollywood here. We have an exciting show today with Lilani Kilgore, a wonderful musician out of Nashville. She shreds it, rock, blues, does it all. Went to Berklee School of Music. Melted is sponsored by Carlino Guitars, and we're so excited to talk to Lani about her life and music in Nashville right now. So exciting. What a great day. We are sponsored by Carlino Guitars, the hottest brand in the land. You can catch Eddie. Just look him up on the internet. He is at 135 Mystic Ave in Medford. He's there Monday through the next Monday. And he has custom straps, custom guitars. He does work for Kiss, members of Guns N' Roses, Cheap Trick, The Talisman, Crimson Wing, The Melted Chapsticks. Eddie does it all. Anything you need for a band, any sort of custom mandolin to blinged out guitar like I have, Eddie can do that. And a warm, melted welcome to someone who brought us Shredding 101, Hurts My Soul, an obsession, rock blues guitarist, none other than Lilani Kilgore. How are you? Hey, how's it going? It is going better now. I am so excited to talk to you about your journey in music, and we really need to get you a social life, although music, you know, you're keeping busy. <laughs> I mean, here we have gig rehearsal, gig rehearsal, gig rehearsal, maybe a little time to smell the roses more rehearsals so <laughs> yeah my off time is usually reserved for naps that's right that's about as social as my life gets. <laughs> which um you know sometimes the humans get in the way so which we're just doing our best but <laughs> i really appreciate the fact a couple things i want to go over you know we're in the boston area so you went to berkeley school of music for a few years how was that experience tell me about the teachers and what did you actually learn or teach them Oh my gosh. Well, I, I mean, um, I loved my time at Berkeley. I really did. Uh, I was, I was straight out of high school, uh, going into it. And I feel like, uh, it was an interesting point in my life to be in such a academically demanding, uh, environment. And it, it, I did struggle, I think with just, you know, suddenly moving to the other side of the country and, and suddenly being just totally immersed in, in what I love doing was a little bit of a challenge for me. Um, but the, I mean, the professors were all incredible. I, uh, I still am in touch with a lot of my professors and I just absolutely love them and respect what they do. Um, I just feel for me, like I, uh, I have ADD, so I struggle anyway in, a, in an academic environment. And um, I felt like after two years, uh, I took all the courses I, I really wanted to take. And um, I, uh, I was struggling a little bit with um, just starting to feel like the academic aspect of playing was affecting the emotional aspect of it for me. So after two years, I thought, you know what, I don't really know what a degree in performance will do for me. So I'd rather just get out there and start playing and start just starting, you know, going down that road of, of seeing where my, my career can go. So it was an amazing experience and I'm super grateful for it. Um, I think it's just, you know, everybody's journey is different and everybody's experience is different. And I think mine, being the two years there that it was, was exactly what it needed to be. No, absolutely. My last guest, uh, Alex Grossi from Quiet Riot, went to Berkeley for two months and then ended up at Quiet Riot and his cover band, Hookers and Blow. So everybody does have a different journey. But, you know, it was great. They they gave you a scholarship, so they thought a ton of you. So... I think that's yeah, I mean, very that's, impressive. That was really, that was really, really kind of them. I, you know, I don't come from a well, a terribly well-off family, and uh, my parents are very hardworking people. And um, there was no way I was going to be able to attend Berkeley without a scholarship. And the fact that they saw that potential in me was really, really flattering, especially because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Right. So I really appreciated them, you know, giving me the opportunity and and taking a chance on just you know some chick with a Les Paul was was really, really cool of them. So I'm always going to be grateful for that. No for, no, for sure. Let's go over like some of your projects because there's a lot of great, I know you've been doing your music videos. I got to see Shredding 101, Hurts My Soul, Obsession. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it's like, yeah, she was inspired by Jimi Hendrix. She's playing the guitar behind her back, sounding a little better than Janis Joplin. How do you, tell me a little bit about the projects that you're in 
And a lot of it's original stuff, correct? Or most of it? Um, yeah, you know, for the most part, it is. And um, I will say that, you know, 2021 especially has been kind of a, a 180 turning point in how I've been spending my time professionally. Because prior to this, and prior to COVID hitting, I was fully immersed in playing classic rock covers on cruise ships. And it would take me out of the country, away from home for about 10 months out of the year. And it was great, but it was a full-time job. And so when I get back, you know, I had no... Honestly, it was, you know, sometimes you just have to take a, a, a respite from, from doing that much playing, you know, six nights a week for three months straight. You don't really want to play the guitar. You just need a break. So that was kind of my full-time gig up until uh, COVID canceled that work. Um, I started just getting myself in as involved as many, in many things as I could just to keep playing because um, there's something terribly, terribly uh, drastic about going from playing six nights a week, three months straight to not playing at all and not going anywhere and being stuck, you know, on in your, your apartment or your house or what have you. So I was getting involved in just a lot of projects. I was doing Broadway shifts uh, last summer and um, uh, the Broadway shift thing kind of fell apart for a little while. So I started playing in other people's bands. I had a lot of friends that would reach out and want to work together and um, started uh, playing gigs down in Mississippi uh, with my stepdad's band. Um, and then eventually around the start of 2021, I had this moment of like, you know, I can, I can either keep doing what I'm doing and roll with, you know, bringing in income via cover band gigs and playing for the people, or I can do this thing that I have been absolutely terrified to take a chance on and just start working on original stuff and seeing what happens. And um, luckily so far in, the, in what little time I've been focusing on it and, and, and pursuing it, it's gone really well which is you know by the good graces of the people who enjoy my music which is amazing and and very very flattering um so now i'm still doing the broadway shifts um because it's just the steady income which i'm absurdly grateful for especially after going through job loss and um other than that i am full on pursuing the original music thing which is uh terrifying and exciting and the only other project I'm really involved in at the moment is uh, a rockabilly band called the Beat Creeps. And uh, we're going to be I in the saw studio that. later this month doing some original stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely primarily original now at this point, which is uh, great. It's, it's new territory for me, and I'm, I'm just uh, grateful to get to be exploring this side of, of my career at this point. So, yeah. I think, and the point is, if whatever you're going through there's a, a 200 million people going through the same thing. Um, Monica Llewellyn is finally writing songs, which I'm so happy to hear. I mean, I'm so thrilled about that. I mean, oh, she's such a lovely person. It, it, she absolutely is with the vocal range of Freddie Mercury. Um, right. But it, the point is, it's like, it's your art. I was talking to um, Serge from the dives, Sergio and he said 60,000 songs, or somebody said 60,000 songs are released on Spotify daily. Now, that could horrify people. Or, this is your art, and that's it. So, you're making it, which is great. A lot of people, you know, may be like, you know, what am I doing? But you're extremely talented, and, you know, when I go to, you know... How do you make sure your one night stand stays a white one night stand? I think that's just wisdom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that you know obsession isn't just a, a, a cologne uh, from Calvin Klein. Um, <laughs> soft hands that know how to touch you, rough kiss that'll suck a bunch of. I need to start dating again, but no, I mean these are your experiences, and it's so much fun to do, and it's your own. And you know what? It's like there's the critic, T Teddy Roosevelt, I think, said, you know, it's it's you that got into the ring that, you know, went after these, you know, journeys and fought so hard to accomplish it. Everybody else wants to sit around and talk about it. I, I don't care what you say, you know, you're doing it. So you yeah. should, I congratulate you. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah, it's, um, there's something incredibly addictive about the amount of risk and care that goes into performing music that you've written that's coming from a personal standpoint versus performing someone else's music and um 
that's something I realized when I played my my first all original show in uh, in March. It's just a feeling that's it's 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 a high, and, you know, it is addictive, and it's it's so fantastic. I mean, like like you said, like you know, Monica, Monica is a phenomenal person, and I just love that she's writing and taking that risk because there is a difference between somebody who can think about doing it and and want to do it and never take that step forward and it's a hugely respectable risk to take on anyone's part no for sure and i feel like you know when we start to compare ourselves to other i think that's where i get into trouble there's only one me there's only one you you're going to do your thing you know talent wise I mean, you're a fantastic guitarist and singer, so you have those things going for you. And then it's just, you know, your inspiration. So it is a big high, and it looked like you guys were having a blast. Um, as far as the music videos, are they going to be taken from the rebar, or is that something separate? For the, for the music video for uh, the, the upcoming single? Yes. So that actually, um, so it's my first music video. We actually shot it mostly um in a hotel room and bless the guy who uh is the the man that i'm yelling at uh within that photo he um had no idea who i was i didn't know him um and we actually matched on tinder eight hours prior to filming because the person that was supposed to be playing the lead or the, the male role uh had a schedule conflict and had to drop out and i was hardcore scrambling so um the fact that he took a risk of some girl on Tinder being like, hey, I need you, if you're interested, you know, meet me at this sketchy hotel on Donaldson because I need to shoot you in a music video. Um, so it is a fully played out storyline. Um, the videos from Rebar, we're going to stick to just being like live releases. For the actual studio track, we're going to use the, um, the footage from the hotel room and, and what we shot at the bar last week. Yeah, I usually call that stuff sketchy hotels a third date, but... Um... <laughs> That and the great the great thing about Tinder now is everybody looks better because they're wearing masks. So I'm swiping right continuously. Um, right. <laughs> you know, which is which is super. Uh, as far as you know, let's just talk about shredding 101, um, and, and then some of your your signal singles. You know, can we go over them? you know, as far as what they mean to you hurts my soul obsession. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Shredding 101 was the solo from, from Hurts My Soul. Um, hurts My Soul is, uh, I think every songwriter is, is a little guilty of this. I think it's kind of a necessity of, of songwriting is you, you want to be able to take a small experience and turn it into this massive uh, experience, you know, in, in the song. So Hurts My Soul was really just um, uh, just about, you know, the way it feels when you're involved with somebody and it's going really well. And for any any particular reason, you know, it's that first time they have to get up and leave and you have to go back to bed without them. And there's something about that feeling and that absence and that loneliness that um, really puts where you're at in the relationship and the perspective. and is kind of like, you know, it makes you realize, wow, I really care about this person. So that's what Hurts My Soul is about. It's about that moment of realizing for the first time you have to go back to bed without them and they're not there and just feeling that that gap in you. Mm. So that's what that one's about. No, it's it's true. I mean, it's really, you know, we all go through different sorts of loss and there's a grieving process and there's different ways to express it, you know, for sure. And then, you know, you heal up and then, you know, you get that amnesia and you do it again. I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. that'll be the uh, next one, amnesia. Why am I in this <laughs> relationship again? Please, dear Lord Jesus. Um, <laughs> I've, um, no, that's, that's totally understandable. And, um, you know, and that's the thing, too. You don't know how many people that you reach through these songs, really. Yeah. And people can yeah, I mean, identify with that stuff. That's the great thing about songs. It's always drawn me to loving the art of songwriting is, is finding a way to connect with somebody over a human experience 
via music. I think that's a really fantastic thing. I mean, obsession's a little, it's not quite as deep. Obsession is more of the standpoint of, um, I started writing that while I was still involved with Jack's Hollow. And uh, I just, I love uh, Jess's very rock and roll energy. Uh, I'm a very rock and roll energy sort of person. And I thought we really clicked well. So I was just thinking, man, I, you know, I just think we need a song that would really just be like a kick-ass, just electric, electric, just powerhouse rock song. So I actually started writing that with Jack's Hollow in mind. Um, and then, you know, we split ways after a little while and uh, I just stuck with the song. And it's really just, you know, it's just a song about being a confident kick-ass woman and just, you know, being very assertive in what you want and how you like things and what you like. So yeah, it's, I mean, that's, it's not quite as deep as, as, you know, feeling a, a loss of someone, but it's, it's, I think, important for, like, I'm very pro-sexuality. I think it's great to be open about, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a female and I'm empowered in that. And um, I think it's, it's, it's okay to be very assertive in your sexual confidence. So that's kind of what that one's, that one's kind of coming from that direction. I'm a little old school. That's usually a fourth date for me. I'm sorry for, uh, you know, I'm just <laughs> I think I know, that, it's a very, like, it's a very <laughs> new age way of thinking. No, I, I think, my, my I don't know, you know, it, this is the thing. It's, um, yeah. Oh, my God. When I think about our upbringings, um, I was raised Irish Catholic, and um, my father said, oh, like, okay, so you definitely he, never he, even broached the subject. Oh, my God. <laughs> that or... Um, <laughs> You know, like I always say, my dad's a cop. He was ripping kiss posters off my wall. And uh, it's just, it's painful. And as far as New Age thinking, people forget that, you know, the Greeks and the Romans were really liberal about their sexuality as well. It's just, you know, we ended up in the United States getting the rejects from the Church of England you know, right. came over here and we're like, we're not having <laughs> any fun. And I think we're going to, you know, try to wipe out a whole race of people. Um, right. So I just, I admire your stand for that. And, you know, being raised Catholic, I was also in an evangelical Christian for a while. So, you know, being in Nashville, I don't know how Bible Beltish it is. Or mm-hmm. do, do you run into a lot of that or... Um, you know, I, I have on occasion, I, my parents are both Christian and Mm -hmm. my, my dad especially is, is very much a a religious person. And, um, I was not raised in a household where being open about, you know, uh, like, uh, physical desires or whatever, it was not, not a thing at all. And I, I kind of grew up feeling like it was something to be ashamed about. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting avenue to take, especially, you know, being 24, that's kind of a, a delicate age a little bit. And uh, I know it's young and, and um, it's, it's a pretty brave subject to broach in a, in a, in a public setting, but in Nashville, I think just because Nashville is cosmopolitan. A, yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, modern. So I feel like um, as far as, as far as being open about, you know, sexuality or, or even just the just fact that you enjoy sex and you can own that, I think it's a little bit, it's easier to deal with in the downtown areas. Now, if you get outside of Nashville, I don't, I don't know how well that would go over because I mean, there is a big difference between, Oh, like Nashville and Murfreesboro. So yeah. And and pastor lock on Twitter. Yeah. I get it. (laughs) God, I mean, I'll unsubscribe to him. Thank you. But it was like even talking to a few of my aunts were talking and they're older and, um, they were like, yeah, we know these two lesbians that were hooking up with a man once in a week. And I was like, okay. Um, I said, when you guys went grocery shopping today, did you tie your horse up, you know, at the <laughs> grocers or early in the day when you, you went to the Acropolis in, in Greece? Did you say hi to Zeus? They go, no, what do you mean? I said, lesbianism has been going on for thousands of years. And I told my drummer about this, and he said, Frankie, is this a lost opportunity? Um, can I get their phone number? I mean, like, it's, but when you talk to certain people are really, 
I look at it this way. Whatever you're taught between zero and seven, you're really stuck with for the rest of your life. And yeah, that, absolutely. It's, it's in graves. Yeah. And that's why we need you to write more songs. Thank you. <laughs> we will straighten yeah, all like... these. <laughs> <laughs> we'll straighten them all out. Um, I really. Well, rock and roll has been, you know, it's been associated with, I mean, what's the, what's the, the, the classic, the, you know, the trio, the holy, the holy trio for rock and roll. It's sex, drugs, rock and roll. Yes. It's, it's kind of a, just a, a going theme with the music. And I think just, you know, because sex is usually a taboo conversation and rock and roll was for a long time was a taboo genre. I think it was just capitalizing on that shock value, something that's been going on for decades. Now, I'm not trying to capitalize on shock value, but I do think there's something to be said for being able to be confident and open in, in the sort of person that you are and, you know, what you're what you're about and what you enjoy and what, you know, whatever. And it's it's just kind of goes with the territory. And I mean, the music video that we shot for Triple X Moonshine, um, it's pretty raunchy and it's my first music video. And uh, I know even in my family, some of my family members said, maybe you should consider releasing a, a different version. And I almost thought about it, and uh, I almost did it. And then I thought, you know what? No, this was my initial vision for the music video. This is what I feel represents the song best. And yeah, there's probably going to be some people that don't like it, but we're going to roll with it because it's just I can't I can't let myself down by complying to somebody else's uh, boundaries. Well, yes, and it's also I think when you come down to it, it's the power structures that be which is George Carlin said it very well, the comedian. He said, the 1% own all the judges, all the politicians, all the good land. We have issues of you know, minimum wage, race relations. I mean, stuff that distracts us that should have been taken care of long ago. Right. So to be able to make, you know, if, it, you know, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. So... You know, you pick and choose, and it's, again, your art at the end of the day. And, I mean, it's all really, in a way, been done before. It's just your spin on it, and that's what makes Absolutely. it beautiful. Really. Yeah, I mean, so you, are you, are you playing around Boston? Is Boston open? Is it, is it functioning? You know what, it, it's not open quite yet. There's live streams we're looking at, because the CDC said today that we don't have to wear masks if you're fully Thank vaccinated. Yeah, yeah, so I got vaccinated like a month and a half ago with the J&J one shot, so I'm all set. Out of respect, I'll wear my mask outside or to the grocery Absolutely. store, wherever I go, and that's it. Now they're saying we don't have to wear masks, and perhaps by, you know, they said August 25th, <laughs> where other states, you know, are open and I know and I want to bring up some really great people beyond here Logan Hatcher um oh, love him very much so uh I just put their episode up uh within the last week and they're doing great things and I saw that he was on some of your stuff and uh he was talking about at the time where some places were closed and then other places outside the city were open so how is Nashville mm -hmm. Nashville, um, and I'll tell you, the biggest litmus test has been uh, Broadway. And because mm. uh, I remember last year when I was doing Broadway shifts, uh, it was 30% capacity, couldn't get up from your table, couldn't dance, had to wear the masks. And it was really, really locked down. Since getting back into Broadway shifts uh, in the past month and a half or two months, there's been a pretty drastic change in, in regulation to the point where I'd say as of two weeks ago, there are no regulations at all. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, when Logan did uh, the two original shows with me, and, and bless him for doing that because, I mean, I know that he has a thousand things going on, and the fact that he put in the time to learn the material and, and showed up and did a kick-ass job of it as well. Yes. Um, they, we played a little outside of Nashville, and I would say that even it was even more lax than, than in downtown. It just it was almost like COVID wasn't really a presence outside of the, outside of the immediate the immediate downtown area. So it's, uh, it's certainly different um, than I know the Northeast is still struggling with, with lifting a lot of the restrictions. So it's pretty much open, I'd say, which is surprising. No, I think that's great. And I think 
the other thing is too, it's, uh, you know, it's when, when you have a global pandemic, you really don't know what's happening. I look at India, it breaks my heart. Oh yeah. Um, you know, so we're, things are happening to, you know, go in the right direction. And now there's a lot of stuff to sing about so we can, you know, bring aware awareness to social issues, uh, and life. So, yeah, I really hope we've been, um, you know, rehearsing the Melted Chapsticks. We've been, you know, rehearsing. We got like 11 new songs we're going to put out. I thank God for punk music. So that includes me. Um, I'm able to, you know, scream and have fun. And that's, if you're not doing that, what are you going to do? Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but, I, I'm always optimistic, but that in the meantime, when I've talked to a lot of different artists, it's really our choice in what we're doing right now, whether things are open or not and mm-hmm. staying positive and throwing out the good energy, you know, and right. it, and it comes right back. Tell me about your custom Epiphone. Mm, I would love to tell you about it. So that is, um. Somebody that's been, I would say, uh, consistently the most um, influential musician as far as playing is concerned, uh, Joe Bonamassa. Um, he's the reason I got into blues in the first place after a, a physically traumatic event where I didn't know if I was going to be able to, be able to play. Um, I saw him live and just went, wow, if you can do that with a guitar, then that's, that's what I want to do. So fast forward, what is it, 2021? 20, so... I guess this would, this would be about eight years ago. Um, the Epiphone that I'm playing is actually his custom uh, signature line based off of his 57 Les Paul custom. And I always swore, because I'm a snob, I would never play Epiphone. I have Gibsons. They're awesome. Always been Gibson loyal. And um, somebody gave me uh, the Epiphone as a gift. And I thought, ah, it's an Epiphone, you know, whatever, but it's free. I'll try it. I can't stop playing it. Nice. It is my favorite guitar. It's just an absolute beast of a guitar. And they really rang true to a 57 custom. And it just, it just rips. And it's, it's my go-to workhorse at this point. I've played it almost every show since getting it last year. And it's just an awesome guitar. And it looks good. It's a sexy looking guitar. Well, you guys accentuate each other. It's all about that, you know? <laughs> Don't hate me. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the aesthetic is great. I'm a fan of you know I I people I don't know what what people usually get the wrong impression of me because I wear a lot of black. I just like the fact that it's easy to color coordinate. Really, so the guitar just really just fits in well with with that whole thing. No, for sure. I mean, uh, I've been accused of being a Satanist before, but that's because I'm wearing <laughs> horns continuously. <laughs> Hail you, hail oh, me. There's a pitchfork? Is that, is that <laughs> there's a pitchfork in the road. <laughs> so so this thing, you know, because you think about the, the Les Pauls and, and Gibson, you know, what is it about this particular guitar that really goes, wow? With the, uh, with the Epiphone? Yeah. Or with just Les Pauls? Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's the triple pickups. Yes. Something I've always loved about Les Pauls is how, is their weight? First of all, I love a good fight. I don't like a guitar that's necessarily easy to play. Um, that's why I struggle with strats a lot. I just, they're really light. And I feel like there's nothing to, to fight with. Um, but so I always thought humbuckers just had a great tone and they're just thick and gritty. And if you, if you start driving the pickup, it just, you know, it just, you can get the most incredible sustain out of it. Um, having the third pickup in there just makes an absolute world of difference. And the range of tone is absurd. So it's a uh, it's a pretty addictive guitar to play because you can just you can just rule the world with it. It's just an unstoppable instrument. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. I'll I'll have to peep that out myself. Um, have you ever checked out? We're sponsored by Carlino Guitars, the hottest cool. brand in the land. Have you ever checked his website out? You know, I haven't, but I did see that you're affiliated with him, so I was going to do a little a little snooping. Yeah, no, he's he's great. He does, you know, straps and guitars for. Slaughter, uh, Michael Sterto, who's in your neighborhood, uh, right. Kiss, uh, some Guns N' Roses, Cheap Trick, etc. So there's a lot of great stuff. And he did a um, PS120 for me 
several years ago. That's a Paul Stanley model. Oh, that's awesome. And it's all blinged out. Because I've seen a lot of your articles, and they're like, oh, she's a badass rock and roll person, a really crushing <laughs> a crushing front woman that's bringing music to the top, people. And she dresses like it with her aviator sunglasses. So people are talking about what you're wearing. I wish they'd leave you alone, you know? But it's like you're just trying to, you know... I mean, that's I'm just what trying happened. to put the least <laughs> amount of thought into it as possible, really. <laughs> the hardest thing is when I actually need to find something in particular, and my, my closet's just all black stuff. Right. It's just stuck into what I'm looking for. <laughs> that's why, I mean, like, it's the, uh, the sequins that help me out. Because if I can't play or sing, I'm going to look like it, baby. And that's what Gene Simmons said. You that's always a dress... Very good idea. <laughs> dress incredible when you walk out um as far as your journeys in music you know you played with all these different bands um you've traveled to mexico as well i lived there for a year do you speak any spanish or you know i didn't i was the uh i had to be the uh the atypical kid in high school and take french instead which i did too i did too did you really yes and I, and I speak fluent Spanish. It's weird. I actually speak English, Spanish, Starbucks, texting, and love. <laughs> and some sarcasm. But um, it's really... No, I lived in Mexico, and that's what helped me learn it. And I love the culture. Uh, fantastic. And, you know, beautiful people are beautiful people. You know? Right. So. It is a really phenomenal place. Um, what part did you live in? I was living on the Pacific coast in Ciudad Obregón, which is in Sonora. Gotcha. Tra- traveled to Hermosillo, down to Jalisco. It's just really a beautiful place. And it's just, um, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, how things separate us, unfortunately, with, you know, I look at like the media and different things like that as they're just trying to sell soap. And you come up with the most outrageous stuff, right. you know, to keep us separated. And it's just, you know, we need to build a wall. And I'm like, everybody, it's, we're, we're on one planet. And then we have Elon Musk sending, you know, spaceships to Mars. Right. We're like, I, I asked people, I said, did you ever think about our neighbors? And they're like, oh, the Smiths. I go, no, Venus, Jupiter. Oh, those neighbors? I go, yeah, they're uninhabitable, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we we kind of can inhabit here. Why don't we take care of each other? Right. Crickets. Okay, but, you know, it's just you, you keep throwing those thoughts out. Maybe they'll catch on. But did you play music in Mexico? Or tell me about some of the cool places you've been to and played. Well, so, yeah, so when I was going down to Mexico while I was still living in California, um, uh, my drummer, who actually just moved to Nashville last year, um, his dad uh, is a musician as well and started organizing a couple of years ago this festival called Baja Blues Fest down in the Baja region. And it, it was just a blast. So we'd go down every summer and and play the festival down there. Um, so that was the first time I traveled outside of the country for music. Last year, or 2019, um, the cruise ship project I was doing did take me to 28 countries wow. which was it really just insane and uh was really this before fortunate. was this before covid it was before covid yeah, yeah. um Man. and then once covid hit i was actually scheduled to be going to iceland and then that all that all fell through right as the pan- pandemic hit so have you said no still, to a no to a project lately have i said no to a project lately yeah. um I have. I've said no uh, a couple of times. Okay, that's yeah. unfortunate. I was going to ask you because that's our dream to go to Iceland and play, and we think we may bring you along. So well, it's like. Well, I mean, listen. <laughs> if you need a guitar tech, and you're no, going no, to Iceland. No, she's like, how much Bitcoin are you sending me right now? <laughs> <laughs> and then we're off to Iceland. No, that's fantastic. You know, this is something we've talked about, joked about, about go to Iceland, and we will do it. It's just, you really can't can't go anywhere these days right now but it's hard. 28 it's countries hard. that's 28 countries and then uh, i've always been a I've, I've been a long-standing um uh anglophile i love britain i love the uk and uh finally got to go to london for music uh last year and wow. um 
I was actually up there organizing, uh, doing some shows and contact about a couple of festivals and then COVID. So unfortunately that fell through as well, but um, yeah, 28 countries and uh, you know, I didn't play in all of them, but uh, I, I did play in their waters. So I don't know nice. if that technically counts. It does to uh, me. It does to me. As your resume now, it goes click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was near Spain. <laughs> Right. right, exactly. I was about 28 meters from land of Spain, yeah. No, that's that's incredible. I actually, for everybody's safety, I haven't had alcohol in 10 years. Really? Um, yes. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's you know, it's, it is what it is. But after I stopped drinking, my life got so quiet, I ended up spending time at Target at 8 in the morning on Saturdays. And then... <laughs> And then filling out forms, so I became an Irish citizen. So I'm EU and US. Wow. Yeah, so if your grandparent had come from Ireland, uh, you can get a citizenship. So, You're kidding. Kid you not. So wow. I don't know, just check you know, where your grandparents are from and if they have something, and you can be a dual citizen. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, well, that's, that's amazing that you're, you are, so you're second generation American? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it was, so what happens is my grandmother's from Ireland. So she's Irish. She comes to the U S becomes a U.S. citizen. My mom automatically becomes an Irish citizen. She just has to fill out the paperwork. No kidding. Yeah. Then her children are allowed to do it, but it's, for example, my sister, her children, because she hasn't done it yet, her children can't get it. So... You know, you have to have it uh, before you have children. Um, not that we're rushing anything, okay, everybody? <laughs> Let's all slow down. Um, dear diary. Um, but yes, so, no, it's, it's, it's great because, you know, when I went to France and Italy, you just, you know, you can slide through the line easier because you're a citizen. Right. Right, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, there is nothing more satisfying than being in France and being able to effectively order a sandwich, yes. thinking back to high school and going, see, this is why I took French, yes. just so I can order a salami <laughs> and pickle baguette. And they this appreciate that it. so much. They do. Yeah, I don't understand. Like, I know some people give France a bad rap. I thought it was a fantastic country. I mean, honestly, my favorite countries that I went to, because I've been uh, everywhere except for Asia. Nice. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the 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 European countries were just all fantastic. I would I would move there in an absolute heartbeat. Historic, um, just great. You know, yeah, I, they, and they really do appreciate history. You know, their their culture, which I think is a phenomenal thing. I think we have a, a bad habit of just tearing down anything that's older than fifteen years. You know what I mean? Which is ah, time to move something else in. You yeah, know? no, just sick of looking at it. Tower of London is over a thousand years old, so it's like the, that's just wild. that. You know, let alone everything else. But the um the other question I had for you is how long did you do the cruise and what was that like as far as a schedule of playing while you were on the ship? So uh, our contracts were three, three and a half months. You would live on the ship for three and a half months. Um, And your schedule was typically um, on six nights, off one night for three months straight. And uh, we actually had it pretty lush uh, considering um, Broadway shifts are, Four and a half hours straight, no breaks. We were lucky enough to do 45 minutes on, 45 minutes off, 45 minutes on, 45 minutes off, 45 minutes on. So we really, you know, we only did three 45 minute sets with uh, equal amount of time for breaks. And um, it was really a really cushy job in, 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 in consideration. I think not everybody is cut out for ship life because it is tricky being in the same small cabin um, with the same people for three and a half months. It can lead to a lot of tension, um, but some people love it. I loved it just because I got to wake up somewhere new every day. And um, I think the hardest thing about it is the fact that you have a built-in audience that doesn't change for anywhere from a week to some people will stay on the ship for like 56 days, just depending on what they booked. So that means it is your job to, even though you're playing the same stuff, you have a, normally we would shoot for having three nights of no repeats you're going to end up repeating stuff. And the hardest thing is just keeping everybody entertained, even though they've heard it all before. 
So it was good practice for showmanship and um, our job was to play as close to the record as possible. So that meant rehearsing every single day, fine tuning all the little details and um, just do that for three and a half months straight. And uh, by the end of the three months, you are exceedingly ready to go home. But at the same time, when you're back, you just can't wait to go out again. So it's um, it was it was a fantastic schedule. We were really spoiled, I would say, in comparison to what a lot of bands have to do uh, in, in the real world. Well, I like your point of showmanship. And, you know, I could see that really, you know, gives you the opportunity. That is a challenge to play the same catalog, if you will. You're seeing the same people. So it's kind of like you have to be on all the time, you know? Yes. And additionally, when you're off stage, people will recognize you because they see you on stage every night. And you will, you know, you see them on the ship, you see them in port, and you just have to be aware of that at all times. It's not exactly about being a character all the time, but keeping in mind that, you know, they're seeing you as somebody who is providing their entertainment and you need to be conscious and respectful of that and just make sure that you conduct yourself in a professional manner. So it's, uh, that's also very good practice. And uh, if there were days, if we had an off day where we decided to get a little unprofessional, we would just go very, very far away from the ship. Right. And just make sure that we were hidden in some, you know, back bar somewhere. No, absolutely. And, and as far as the catalog, did you get to pick the songs or does the cruise ship, you know, give you, you know, some discretion on what you're playing? Well, our company, Rolling Stone Rock Room, uh, in affiliation with the magazine, um, was partnered okay. with Beale Street, which is the owner of the BB King Blues Clubs. Yes. And they would give us the catalog. It was, I think it was about 300 songs that had been pre-approved. And really the biggest thing was you just learn as many of those songs as humanly possible, as quickly and accurately as you can. So we had a pretty wide range of songs to pick from. I mean, it was anywhere from Elvis to Steppenwolf to... Uh, I think uh, Zeppelin and ACDC. So really a, a wide range to choose from. Foo Fighters was in there. and Nice. Yeah, I mean, really the biggest thing was, uh, strangely enough, depending on where you were in the world, um, like if we were in Norway, for example, or if our home port was Amsterdam, Radar Love by Golden Earring was an absolute must because it's a Dutch band. So you would kind of fine tune the set list depending on where you were and what was going to be popular for those audiences. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty big catalog of, of, of mostly really enjoyable stuff to choose from. Um, if I never hear Louie Louie again, I think I'll be okay. Yes. I think I'll survive. Yes. But uh, <laughs> other than that, it was pretty good. Now, were you singing this whole time or just playing guitar? Singing as well, yes. God so love I you. Share, I would share front vocals. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was great practice for being a front one because I'll, I'll tell you, like in the past, I don't think that ever really had mattered to me so much. But suddenly being in a situation where if you, because uh, we would get ratings, our venue would get ratings, and the goal was to be the top rated venue every at the end of every cruise or, you know, risk losing your job. So um, being forced in a situation where you suddenly have to be putting everything you have out there for those 45 minutes was great practice and a great reality check for what it means to be a performer. Well, when we do our St. Patrick's Day parades in Boston, which uh, our last two were canceled, but we did two, the two, the two years before. That's amazing, by the way. That's an epic parade. I, I do remember those. Yes. And with, with that said, the good news was everybody was wasted in the crowd. <laughs> and <laughs> unlike you, who stuck with these people for a few years, each <laughs> three blocks, we had a new audience. So... The first year we had like 12 songs and then we realized we only need four (laughs) and I still don't know them, but it's like, I want to be sedated. Is that the lyric? Hold on, buddy. (laughs) That's the same thing as busking. You know, like I used to think, oh, I have to have three hours of music memorized if I'm going to go busking. And then you quickly realize, no, you really don't. No, no. that you're, you're loitering by, but... <laughs> Keyword loitering. I mean, we're all just really trying to make a living <laughs> and try to have a little fun. That's what I last, you know, heard about with all this stuff is, you know, are you having a good time? And it really seems like you are in the midst of being so busy. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm not one that's terribly social anyway. I kind of joke about not having a social life. I really didn't have them to begin with. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, a, a hermit, if you will. Um, I like my apartment. I like my guitars. I like my horrible reality TV shows and true crime theories. And that's kind of my thing. Um, but with my schedule, the way that it's, it's ended up being with, you know, I think next week we start doing, I start doing eight hours of gigging plus the rehearsals, plus whatever else comes up. And, uh, and then I travel seven and a half hours on the weekends for my Mississippi gigs. So I've, I'm, I actually like having this schedule since starting getting back into Broadway shifts and, and doing gigging every night of the week, no matter where it is. Um, I, I think there was a, a period for about a month where I didn't have a single night off. And somebody um, who's very close to me said, hey, you need to you need to have a night off. You're wrecking your voice, first of all. You're not sleeping. You really do need to take a night off. Please, for your own sake, take a night off. So I did, and I really struggled with it. I had, I was antsy. I didn't know what to do with myself. All I could think about was, man, I should be on stage right now. So I actually love, I love being busy because if I'm not, I, I don't, I don't know how to handle it at this point. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm so stoked to get to look at my calendar and just see uh, every single day there's something going on. It's, 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 it's reassuring because I, I don't like having downtime. I'm not good with it. So. Well, you know what? That's the whole thing. We do another podcast called Secondhand Therapy where we bring experts on because we can't afford our health care. And <laughs> And then we, and then, and then I'm like, That's oh, what my wine subscription is for. That's my therapy. Right. It's like, no, these are all things. It's just called awareness. You know what I mean? Right. You're aware of that. I mean, I remember, and I, th- this is what I started to put together, and I'm not going to put all musicians into this, but I'm very outgoing wherever I go. Hey, Frankie, what's up going on? But I really kind of realized that I'm an introvert. Right. And I, I mean, it's, you probably experience what I know myself and a lot of my friends experience is when you're out socializing, you are a hundred percent an outgoing bubbly person, but it's taxing. And then you need that time alone. Do you go through that as well? No, absolutely. It's, it's something where, and we haven't been able to do this stuff, but you know, I go out and I actually, it's weird because I'm bubbly as well, but me being kind and I, I coined this phrase if you can make people laugh underneath their mask, you've done your job. Because it's so hard, you can't see people's faces. So if I can crack right. a joke through my mask and hear them laugh, you know, just it's another way to strengthen my comedy. Um, yeah, but then it's it's kind of like I don't want to go out. I don't really, you know, I'd rather be alone. So this is just stuff you realize, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's, 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 it's okay. Yeah. I think it's just not what a lot of people expect from, especially people in genres such as punk rock music, where it's so high energy and, and very much in your face or rock or what have you. I think a lot of people expect anybody who performs for a living to just, and I do know some people who are out there socializing all the time when they're not playing. And I, I so envy and respect that because that's such a, that sounds like such an, it just sounds like you're like, I don't, I don't know how anybody would have the mental energy to be doing it all the time. But I think a lot of people that, you know, don't know you or, or are not in the profession, they just think, oh, that must be how they, they are. But in reality, I think a lot of, I think a lot of performers are, are really introverts behind closed doors. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that because it's like, and that's why, you know, you always have to remember, uh, you know, when you're out there, my uncle said he'd rather be rich than famous. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. Secondly, right. it's like these people, no matter what musician, you're the people that you love. They they can only drive one car at a time. Hey, I got 25 cars. Yeah, I can drive one at a time. I can, <laughs> as much That's as right. I, I try to drive two cars with my mind and my telepathy, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Same with clothing. So it's kind of a grounding thing. The more you understand yourself, the more you understand others, the more you throw out Paul Stanley said in his book or in interviews that he always projected to play to 80,000 to 100,000 people, you know? So it's just our projection, what we want to happen. So you are well on your way. 
and uh, doing great things. What is it like to play music with a family member? Um, so uh, I am adopted, and um, Chris, my stepdad, um, is married to my biological mom. And um, I met him for the first time when they flew out for my high school graduation. And then after that, wasn't really in a whole lot of contact with them. Um, my adopted parents are not musical. They're just music lovers, which I'm very lucky to have. Um, but once COVID hit and I lost my contract that was lined up and because I was supposed to be gone for an extended period of time, had no other work lined up, um, Chris, my stepdad reached out and said, hey, Mississippi is still totally up and running. You should come play with my band until you can get back on your feet, which literally saved my life. So um, playing with my stepdad is such an absolute joy and blessing and i am endlessly grateful to get to do it because it's there's just something about working with a family member especially you know and i'm really really close to my my biological family at this point it's just awesome. there's just goofiness all the time on stage and there's just trust and you don't you know and i think in some band situations depending on who you're working with you can kind of feel like you're on your own a little bit or there's you know you just have to be on your toes all the time or on edge and that's so not the case. Uh, he's a wonderful, super talented guy. His band is great. And it's like, it's just like, it's just like hanging with a family and just making music with, with my family. And it's, it's such a blast and I can give him a hard time on stage and I can, you know, be a brat and, uh, or show off or do whatever. And, uh, it's, it's fine. And it's, it's very freeing and very rewarding. And I am, I'm really, really lucky to be able to share that experience with him. No, Thanks for sure. COVID. And they, they are fortunate to have you. You're a fabulous talent. And, you know, as, well, you're, thank you. as you're doing, you you have that freedom to be the front woman and be a brat and do your thing on stage now to feel free to do that as well, you know, and just, you know, keep having that sort of fun. It It is amazing because... What you brought brought up earlier, as I've talked to many artists, you need to have a good team because yes. it's 20 hours sometimes on a tour bus airport. Mm -hmm. If you can't have laughs and jokes and be cool, it's like, and then on top of it all, you were on a ship. You know, it's not like I can get away from these people. <laughs> Even if you wanted to, you can't escape them. It, yeah. it, it, except in our <laughs> cases, you and I walk on water. So it's like, that's the good thing. It's like, is that Jesus? Who's that out there? Dark hair. She's awesome. So, yeah, it's it's like, that's what's important is surrounding yourself with, with good folks. So it's like, and for me... To Led Zeppelin, to you, we all have those components because it's like a marriage, and you right. know, it's either going to be truly a relationship, going to be a, a good one, or you know, and that's you know, you can also in talking to some artists, it's like it also depends what you've been hired for because sometimes you don't get a say, and that's fine too. It's just knowing your role, but like I just I would rather be around cool people. That's just me. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a, do you ever see that documentary, um, was it Hired Guns with Nita Strauss and I think Duff McGee? You know um, what, I'm going to, I'm going to watch that if you will, and you may have seen this already, but this is a robbery. Have you seen that on Netflix? I have not. It's about the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum that got robbed right down the street from the Berkeley School of Music. You're kidding. No, they stole 14 paintings it's the biggest art heist, and it happened on because St. Patrick's Day Parade is always the Sunday after the 17th. Right. So all the police are in South Boston with my family, including my dad yelling at my hair. From there, <laughs> from there, everybody is away from downtown, and everybody's wasted. And so right. that night, you know, a couple guys dressed up as police officers— and rob the place. Get out of here. Are you serious? Yes. Look on Netflix. This is a robbery. Four episodes. I know you're going to enjoy it. You'll see some of the old scenery. And actually, oh. I, I all right, I'll ruin the ending. Um, they have you placed there in 1990. How old were you? 
1990? Yeah. I was not alive. Okay, so we're was, still pinning I mean, it. We're still t- we're still trying to pin pin it on you. But anyways, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I think it was Lonnie. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sounds like something she'd do. <laughs> so no, that's a really cool one. So hired guns. What did you think of it? Well, I uh, you know I liked it. Um, I only saw it the one time, but something that did stand out to me was I think it was Nita Strauss or somebody talking, or maybe it was Steve Lukather. I think it was Lukather talking about how um, when you get hired as a hired gun. What it really comes down to is, I think he said, like, 10% of your ability to play and 90% your ability to hang. Right. I think is what he said, which, you know, I I never crossed my mind as a concept. Like, hey, you need to be somebody people enjoy being around. Maybe try to be sociable. Um, But it is a terribly important aspect because when you're, you're right, when you're in a tour bus, when you're on a ship or whatever, if you don't like the people around you, you're not going to like what you're doing. And it will inadvertently show up on stage. No, for sure. Especially on Saturday Night Live, I think, when one of the Red Hot Chili Peppers kicked <laughs> another guy in the behind during the show because he screwed up the solo on purpose because he was pissed at the lead singer. I mean, it's just so much fun, you know, turning everything up to 11. And, um, you know, I enjoyed the Quiet Riot documentary. And just to see this stuff is just, you know, really interesting and um you know, you've you've been through it already and good things are happening. As we close, why don't we just, do we have a title for your, have you put out an EP? What are we doing? So what I am doing is, I, this is my long-term, my long-term con here, is um, uh, the only music I have out is stuff that I either tried, uh, attempted to master myself and mix myself, which went atrociously. Or uh, it's, you know, five, four years old. So the current plan is um, I have these singles that I recorded out in California. Um, that first one will be released with the music video, Triple X Moonshine. Following that will be uh, I'm Gonna Leave You. And then uh, we're, there will be a third single in the works in June or July. And then uh, after that, I, I will be, uh, the biggest thing is finances. So that's part of the reason I'm working so much because um, I do believe in, in and earning your money. Um, I will be hopefully producing an EP or recording an EP with a producer friend of mine here in Nashville. And then the ultimate goal is to have enough material to manage to convince a producer with a good track record to work on an album for me. So that is the the ultimate goal and have that hopefully in the works by, by 2022, early 2022. So for now we're gonna do singles, then an EP, and then start on an album, if I can convince anybody to, to take a chance. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, you're really in the right place. There's so many solid people that I've interviewed from, you know, beyond here, the true villains, Monica, yourself. All fantastic people, by the way. I think it's just great that, that you interviewed them. Because every single every single person in all those camps are phenomenal people. Yeah, and that's, and that's the whole thing about, you know, helping each other out. I mean, a lot of people, I'm not saying a lot, but if people have the mindset, like, I'm not going to help you, well, that's <laughs> not going to stop me. I'm sorry. Right. You know, that's just it. I don't care if it's my dad ripping down kiss posters, even in this point in time, he walks in the room <laughs> and it's like, I, I have a, a license and I legally could drink and you're ripping down a kiss poster now. <laughs> I'm like, you are not going to stop me, my friend. Um, so it doesn't oh, yeah, matter. I still get grief about my hair from my mom. It's constant. I, I'm like, Mom, uh, you're 1,700 miles away. How are you still on my case oh about my bangs? God. I know. <laughs> listen, I was told not to get. I can, I'm going to try bangs out. I promise. Um, but um, as far as then, I saw that you do have a couple upcoming shows. Um, are you going to regularly yes. post them on? your social media, because I'm going to blast all of that out. Uh, oh, that's well, really sweet of you. I appreciate that. Yeah, when I have um, it up in a couple of days. Yes, I do. I uh, I um, always would, well, since I started doing the original shows, um, the third one that's coming up, uh, a band called Bad Cameo, which is a great band uh, from Florida. They're doing a, a, a nationwide tour and stopping at the East Room, and they were kind enough to ask me to join the bill 
um, for their show in June. And then I have, I think, a couple other original shows next month coming up after that. So I will always be posting about those because, um, because it's very exciting for me and I'm very excited. So uh, yes, I will definitely be posting about them. I am horrible at social media management. My Facebook page is basically a crypt at this point, but uh, <laughs> Instagram at least is, is usually pretty up to date. No, and that's, you know, that's the thing, especially I, I look at, you know, a lot of artists and there hasn't been much to post anyways, but I did see, you know, you do, even on your website, I believe that's where I saw a few of the shows posted as well. That's, so Yeah, that's the best I can do. And thank God for technology and calendar sync, because otherwise I don't, mm. I don't think I would ever see the light of day. Thank you for being on. You're so talented, Lilani. And uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate what you're doing. And then maybe what we can do, you know, down the road as you, do some more stuff. We'll have you back on the show. That would be amazing. And thank you so, so much for having me. I mean, it really means the absolute world to me that you wanted to, to chat. And uh, I, I mean, this was an absolute blast. And thank you so much. We actually laugh till we cry. We've learned a lot about, um, I told, called my aunts up and I said, uh, you know, I want a vacation. And then like, well, where are we going? And I go, Lesbos. <laughs> And I go, I go, I go, this stuff is on the internet. My drummer's trying to find these women. You know, it's like, is this a missed opportunity? God help us all. But you keep staying strong. You are such a rock star. And oh, well, thank you. Just, just the way it goes. No, well, it's like I said, it's, and so many of your interviews, they talk how you dress and you rock out. And anyone who sees your videos, and I recommend everybody to jump on YouTube onto your page, um, you rock and you shred. I love how it's like, I really like I'm a blues uh, person. And then you're just shredding it like shredded wheat. So, <laughs> you know, know. I, so. They're like, you know, you really don't play blues, right? Like, <laughs> where? Like, well, that's gonna be that's gonna be a Monica Llewellyn intervention call. It's like we're gonna invite you over. <laughs> we're gonna have a hundred people in the room, and we're just gonna say, look, you know, we're gonna hand over a flying V to you. <laughs> it's like we're done with your shenanigans, okay? But Joe loves you. Joe loves you. <laughs> well, you have a great day, and we will talk soon. Thank you so much. Hopefully, we can meet in person and jam sometime. No, and, and when when I when I come to Nashville, and I'm telling you, you know, unfortunately for everybody, I'm bringing my singing voice and my guitar, but I will bring some Moroccan oil so we can just do our hair wildly. <laughs> Is that what I'm missing? Is that the hair? Part? Oh my god! At least it smells great. I don't know what it does, but. <laughs> fighting the reason i picked up kung fu as a child i had to fight my three sisters over the flat iron so you know we all have our own stories <laughs> but uh you must have been you must have grown up in the 80s um we are not i'm 28 again let's just leave it at that where <laughs> your investigative team figures out that i robbed the isabella stewart gardner museum when i was 70 in 1990 <laughs> Lilani, you're the you best. Are, this is just a cover. It is. And it's not a cover show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we open for you. So um, when I get down there, you know, you and Monica will tear it up, okay? Oh, I can't wait. All I absolutely right. can't wait. I you, have a cannoli for it. I will. I'll bring some down. Mike's pastries, yeah, I promise. Mike's pastries. <laughs> <laughs> you know it all. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye. Well, what a really great time with a super rock star front woman, Lonnie Kilgore, who does play blues. She also shreds the guitar, has some great originals coming out. An EP shortly. Check out Obsession. Hurts My Soul. He has her residency and she's doing great things and you know, we're just so grateful to talk to great artists and highlight their great work. And another great episode of Melted, sponsored by Carlino Guitars, Lilani Kilgore. We're going to keep playing rock music, whether people like it or not. And we're going to just keep letting our light shine and 
being open about sexuality. I don't know what that means, but jump on Tinder and try it out. Thank you.